that is a song called Cut to the Feeling by Carly Rae Jepsen. And it came out maybe a couple weeks ago. And when I heard it, my first thought was, where has she been? Uh, you know, it's like, this is, you know, we needed a good summer, uh, summer anthem, kind of a follow up to Call Me Maybe. And then I had another thought, like, Cut to the Feeling, like, it kept resonating with me. And then I had a thought that, for most of my life, I didn't have any feelings at all. My two top feelings were, I'm not, not enough, I'm not lovable, three feelings. And I have to, and have to be somebody else for people to love me. And so, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't have real true feelings until I was about 27 years old and I just turned 40. I did a lot of strange people. I don't know what. I should probably keep an eye on the time because I think it can be forever. All right, so I'm going to take you on a journey with me back to me as a kid. Uh, I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a very, very wealthy town. So I grew up around a lot of wealth, not in it, around it. So that was the first part. Oh, I'm not enough. Like, these are the rich people, and we're not rich. We were comfortable. We had more than enough, but it didn't feel like enough. When you live in 2,500 square feet, and some of your friends live in 10 to 15,000 square feet, it doesn't feel like enough. And so, from an early age, I started to study what other people did, what they looked like, what they wore, how they acted, and then I tried to channel all of that to recreate myself. So, my two mechanisms when I was a kid were lying and embellishing when I was out in the world. And when I was at home, I had this whole, whole other fantasy life that I created. When I was around, around like seven years old, my sister and I used to play house. We lived in the top floor of our house, bedrooms across from each other. And we, were, we decided we were these English sisters. Um, we were British, we were very wealthy in our minds. And I think this this went back and forth until like between my ages of seven and nine. And then we kind of stopped playing it, but I continued playing it with myself until I was about 16. I was Sandra Schilling. I was British. I was 40 years old. I had four kids. Uh, my husband, I was single because my husband killed himself. I might have had another marriage and then I got divorced. I had a string of bad relationships. My daughter was a drug addict, and my youngest son had a learning disability. And not only that, but I was the Oh Sandra, I'm not Sandra anymore, I realize this, was the Oprah of London. I had, she had a successful talk show, and then at one point she, she got into music and had a very successful music career uh, going on tour, and I would literally sit in the bathroom for like, Hours looking in the mirror, doing my hair, pretending I was about to be on stage. I would sing, do all this stuff. And that was my fantasy life. That is what I slipped into all the time when no one else was around. I didn't want to have any feelings. And so I wanted to be anybody but me. And I could have had any fantasy life, but what was that? A 40 year old, fucked up, narcissistic, with a chaotic family and failed relationships. Like, that's my fantasy life. I had four kids, I was 40 years old, traveling the world, and I was 13. Not, not good. I was gonna say not normal, but that's not not normal, that's my normal. And so, I'm a huge liar, and I'm embellishing, my last name is Marshall, all these people that I knew had, you know, they were household names, family-owned businesses, so I was like, oh, well, we own Marshalls. Uh, department store. You know, like everything was a lie, everything was embellished. And then by the time I got to middle school, the inevitable happened. People started bullying me. And, uh, you know, the dreaded F word, faggot. And people basically told me I was gay before I knew I was gay. I, you know, I had some feelings, things were a little bit different, and I was a woman in my spare time. But people started calling me names, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, oh, that's what that is. So society told me I was gay before I decided that. 
And that's where the shame began. That's where I slipped further into my fantasy life. That's where I started stuffing down. And I didn't acknowledge it. Like, you know, you could be making fun of me, but I'm here with my friends, and I pretended to ignore it. And I didn't want my friends to see it either. And it was super painful. And it, it created this feeling of, I'm not safe and I I can't tell anyone. Because if I tell my family that I'm being bullied, well, they're going to, I didn't want them to feel bad, like, oh, I'm a loser son. I didn't get the good, cool kid. Like, I got back to, like, that, and everyone was making fun of. So I didn't want them to know, and I also didn't want to out myself. And I never wanted to talk to my friends about it, because I didn't want to drag the energy down, and I don't know. So this went on for years. And once I got to high school, it's like people were calling me names, Clicking rubber bands, throwing gum at me. And I grew up in a respectable town with like smart people, and like I was treated like shit. But the other part of me is I had a lot of friends, and I tried to overcompensate. I studied what the cool, popular, smart people, rich people did, and I dressed like them, I acted like them, I talked like them, I did what they did, and I was one of them. And so years later, you know, I think, oh, I'm so healed, oh, I'm so healed. And I realized last year I still have so much trauma from being bullied as a kid, and I haven't talked about it. Because I don't want you to think that being bullied for being gay means who's are not cool, because I've spent my whole life trying to be cool, trying to fit in, be the life of the party, and I was that. So by the time I discovered alcohol in high school and, you know, vanity, lots of vanity, like, just always look good on the outside, pretend people are not bullying. And so I'm like drinking, having fun, and I go to college. And in college, it's amazing because I went to college in another state. So nobody knows what the house you grew up in looks like. And when you're from Greenwich, Connecticut, like that's your car. Like I could live in a shack or an apartment, or I could live in a 15,000 square foot home. Nobody knew. And by that time, I had studied kind of like the high end culture and had it like down to science of dropping like subtle things without being like, I'm so rich, but like subtle things that would suggest like, oh, I'm a baller. Like I went with my aunt and uncle to St. Bart's, we flew on a private plane over Easter break. I was really just back at home at the tanning salon. I lied, I was such a big liar. Like thank God social media did not exist at that time because I didn't have to like, where you got corroborating my lies. It was just like, nobody knew. You had the tan, they believed you went away. Because who would lie about that? <laughs> if anybody sees this, they went to college with me, they'll be like, oh, you really weren't in the same part. So it's just real. Most of them were. <laughs> and those are the parts I love about myself. So in college, and I've always had a double life. It's like, who I'm curating on the outside, and like, what my secret fantasy life is. And so by the time, like towards the end of high school, it's like, I did kind of like realize my sexuality. And then I, you know, was cruising and sneaking off to like parks and I'm like 17 or 18, like a high school, like junior or senior sneaking off. Nobody knew it was like the dirty secret. And so in college, it was like, I was a huge drinker and I tried to be friends with everybody and I needed to prove that I was friends with everybody. So I'd go around the bars and look at my insurance and like life of the party. And all of a sudden, uh, I have my disposable camera with me and I'll take pictures with anybody that I meet, especially if they're like cool or good looking. And then I develop the pictures and I hang them on the walls of my dorm room. I like could have invented Instagram. And but this was my wall of like, I'm cool, I'm popular, I've arrived. And you know, I had a double life in college of yeah, social fun, and then I was like on the internet cruising, hooking up like all the time, like sex addict shit, like not getting my work done and feeling really bad about myself. All this time, I'm like, who is feeling like really bad about myself? But you were the last to know. And I was like, fine, everything was okay. And then I was hung over and I felt so bad. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go on sex now. And so it was just like a whole, like, a whole life of not feeling feelings. Or if I did, I didn't know what they were or how to identify them or how to process them. It was kind of like, if I just pretend it's not happening, it's not happening. And if I wear a cool J. Crew shirt and tell you I went to St. Bart's, 
hopefully, maybe somebody will be jealous of me, and then I have to worry about feeling like this piece of shit. And what ends up happening is, I was the most self-destructive person I've ever known. And by the time I graduated college, I moved to New York, and it's like, oh, nobody's like looking over me. I have one roommate. She knows I'm gay. I can do what I want. I mean, I was out in college, but like nobody knew what my side, you know, my side thing was. It's just like hooking up in public bathrooms, going in the woods. Like if you're gay, there's like sex is everywhere. If you want it, you can find it at any time. Now we have these apps. It's like God forbid. I'm married now. Now we so we're good. I feel that part. And so uh, I will get to the point. So. And this story like wraps up pretty quickly because maybe I need some water. Maybe not even like a year out of college, I discovered drugs, and that's pretty much where the story ends because not many success stories start with I discovered drugs. And so it was like this period of maybe two years where it's like casual, and then it was like more and more and more, and then I'm saying, I can do any drug that I want. And I will sleep with people for drugs. I will, you know, not show the work. I'll be a huge liar. And then I'm trying to clean myself up when I had to go to somebody's birthday party. But more and more things happened, and I wasn't showing up to birthday parties. I almost didn't make it to my sister's wedding. Uh, I was home for Thanksgiving and stole my parents' car, went looking for drugs, found them, disappeared for two days. Nobody's like knowing where I am, or should we call the police? Who knows? I dealt the car at this train station. I call my roommate and I'm like, Can you tell my parents that I'm safe? The car's at the train station. I left the key under the mat and I'm going to the sex club. Like, this was my life. And I was maybe like 20, I was 26 at this point. And it had gotten so dark and gone so far down that there was this period in my life for six weeks where I was like, I just want to die. I want to die. I couldn't stop craving, but I couldn't get sober. I was like going to these harm reduction groups. I knew something was up. Like I knew there was something wrong. So I was going to these harm reduction groups. When you're a drug addict, that does not work. Uh, in my opinion, just for me, it might work for somebody else. But you know, when you're you know smoking crack casually, it's like there's no harm reduction in there for me. And so. This went on, and I just really wanted to die. I, every night I went to bed, and I was like shaking and paranoid, and I was like, just let me fucking die. And I did it. And that's kind of my main thing here. It's like no matter how far down that you go, how hurtful it is, how awful it is, how much stuff you've created, how many people you've fucked over, including yourself, as long as you don't die, there's a chance to get back up and turn things around. I remember my mom said at one point, God allows you turns. And that has stuck with me because it's like, even now, it's like I make a lot of mistakes, but that's just like life prep. We, we're in these rooms, we hold space for each other. We're teaching each other tools to heal and grow and move forward. And so I woke up one morning, December 15, 2003. I woke up in somebody else's bed. And it was a few blocks from my apartment. It had been like a, like a one week spree. And I was like, I'm going to be sober today. I actually didn't feel I'm over. I didn't feel like shit. I was going to be sober today. I put down the crack pipe and I was like, out of here, as if I was Elwood's going to college. <laughs> so I get home, I shower, I go to work, and I'm sober. I'm sober. And I did it. I actually did get sober on that day. And with, with the exception of two days in the last 13 years, um, I had a, a couple slips, but um, those are kind of those things like when you're moving out of your lane, your car beeps. If you have one of those modern cars that does that, it's like, oops, you're leaving your lane, get back in. And so, so I've been kind of on this journey for 13 years. And the minute I stopped drinking and doing drugs, I thought, well, okay, now I'm going to have a life. Like, this is like, that's just it. What I realized is the drugs and the alcohol and the sex and the acting out and the lying and all of that bullshit in the fantasy life was just stuff to not feel. I just didn't want to feel, and I didn't know that. And so this last 13 years has been all about like feeling my feelings and thinking that, oh, you get to a certain point, you're like, oh, but now like, 
this doesn't bother me. But no, I was at this retreat last year, and something came up, and it's like, I don't allow myself to rely on others, and do I have a sense of self? These were the two things that came to me, and I was like, what does that mean? And then as I really thought about it, it's like, I don't allow myself to rely on others. Well, why not? Well, because I only rely on myself. I didn't tell anybody what mean I was in a kid. I was practically dead before, you know, I went to the emergency room several times in my addiction, and it's like, oh, God. And so now I'm, I'm still in the process of healing that shame and trauma from being bullied and sucking it down. And I thought I was going to talk about a completely different topic. I was gearing up, really wanted to shock you, and then I was like, wow. Oh, I haven't healed that yet. Like, how dare I get up here and tell you about healing shame from a certain other really dark part of my life that I've really dealt with, that I've kind of ignored. And so what I want to wrap this up with is that for me, it didn't matter how many feelings I shut down for how long. If they're meant to come up, they will. And it doesn't matter if you've like one tiny one hiding here and it's like, okay, no big deal. It'll come up. Probably. And if you're in this room and if you're on this path, it will. And you probably have healed a lot of shame or trauma or guilt or, you know, maybe you're compulsive a liar like me. I don't lie anymore. Like when I tell lies, it feels so uncomfortable. It's like my heart's like, no. And so to revisit feelings, my whole point here is like, if you haven't, no matter how far down you go, if you haven't died, back up. And you don't have to do it alone. And if you're in this room, you're not alone. Like, Anybody here that will be happy to help you and hold space for you. And the other part is, as you revisit these feelings and heal these feelings, like trained professionals, therapists, sponsors, programs of recovery, there's a 12 step for every malady out there. I could probably qualify for 90% of them. And so there's, there's tapping, uh, EFT, and there's EMDR, there's, you know, all these things. And so I am still on this journey of feeling my feelings to heal it. And when I look back and talk about Sandra Schilling or all the line, I don't have this like uh, feeling. I'm kind of like, that was amazing. Like, good for me. Like, thank God I came up with those tools. At the time, they saved me. And, you know, they made fodder for if I ever write a good book. Like, Sandra had quite a, quite a life, but uh, as did my lies. And I'm just happy to be here today with all of you holding space for me. I'm grateful. I don't know how much time I've gone over, but I feel good about it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I bless you all. Thank you. And